I would also like to thank the organizers for this very nice meeting. So uh, today I would uh, like to discuss some recent work that I had been doing with my colleague Krishnendu Sen Gupta at ISES. And uh, I won't have time to discuss all of it because this is a short talk and some of the things are a bit technical. But uh, if you're interested, you can see this uh, archive preprint. Okay, so the question that we ask here is, uh, suppose I have a extremely large quantum many body system and it's completely isolated and it's being continually driven, then how does this kind of a system relax to its ultimate steady state? Okay, so I said that it's isolated, so there is no heat path coupled to it. And the driving here is purely uh, due to some time variation of some coupling present in the Hamiltonian. Okay, so uh, Arnav already mentioned this model, okay, and actually in this talk, one can think of many other models like the 2D Kitai model. So all these models have one common feature, uh, which would really help us in uh, solving for the dynamics of a many body system, which is that uh, uh, these can actually, even though these are spin models, these can actually be mapped to free fermion models by this well-known Jordan Wigner transformation. Okay, so that's why these are all integrable models where if you actually take n spins, you have order n integrals of motion. And that actually helps you a lot in solving for such stuff, okay? So today we'll just restrict ourselves to this class of models. Okay. Right. So as I said, you can map the spins using the jordan wigner transformation to free fermions. This mapping is non-local, but it's still a perfectly unitary and one-to-one -one mapping, okay? So you don't lose any information. And then, uh, because you get free fermions, then you can just simply go to momentum space and think of the fermions in momentum space and then the dynamics actually becomes very simple to imagine and calculate. So basically at each k point, you can just think of a pseudo spin representation where you can just think that the spin up is this. Okay, this is the vacuum of the C fermions and the spin down is this. And there is a time dependent magnetic field. Okay, if you wish. And uh, these things are time dependent because your couplings are changing in time. And at each k, you just have to solve this two cross two problem. And once you know uh, the uv, which is just the amplitude of this guy and the amplitude of that guy, at each k, you have information about all correlation functions at any finite time. Okay, so that's the scheme in which you can solve for these things. Okay. And in this talk, uh, uh, I'm going to take uh, G to be a periodic function of that. Okay. So here, since we are interested in the relaxation to the steady state, I'll just first flash the result. And so the main message is that here, uh, for these class of models, and this can be generalized to higher D very simply, uh, the relaxation, the long time relaxation to the steady state is always algebraic in time. That's result one. And uh, uh, the, the power of that DK uh, is actually one number in these shaded regions and a different number in the other regions. And here you're just changing the frequency of your periodic drive. Okay, so there is a dynamical phase transition. Even though there is no phase transition in the steady state, but if you look at the approach to the steady state, if you're at these frequencies, it's something totally different from if you're at any of the other frequencies. And uh, the result here is that the relaxation here is one by t to the d plus two by two, and everywhere else where it's white, it's one by t to the d by two. Okay, good. Uh, right, so uh, what got me started into this project was uh, actually this issue about entanglement here. So, and this is actually very pertinent here. So you. Imagine that you start from a ground state of uh, whatever initial Hamiltonian you're taking and you keep on driving your system. Then eventually, oh, sorry. Eventually the system would actually have a large coupling with many high energy excited, excited states. But 
the entanglement entropy behavior of the ground states and typical high energy excited states is actually fundamentally different from each other. So basically what I mean is if you have these localized degrees of freedom which were spins there, then if degrees of freedom in region A are coupled to degrees of freedom in region B, and then if you just partially trace out region B, then of course even though the full density matrix is that of a pure state, this partial, this reduced density matrix would look like a mixed density matrix, right? And then, for example, to characterize that, you can just take the von Neumann entropy of that, and that you can call the entanglement entropy. So for the ground state of typical local Hamiltonians, uh, this follows the so-called area law. So imagine that this subsystem that you're tracing out from a big system has a typical linear dimension of L, then this S, this entanglement entropy scales as L to the D minus one. Whereas for typical high energy states, it scales as L to the D. So this is called area law scaling and this called volume law scaling. So one immediate question is how does this crossover take place? Okay. So, so here I just show exact results for a certain kind of a protocol where you can just analytically do this. And because these are integrable models, actually the reduced density matrix, so let's say this is your subsystem and this is the rest of the system. So you want to trace out the rest of the system as a function of time, because you know the full wave function psi of t as a function of time. Uh, then, because of the integrability, all that one needs to do is to construct two L cross L matrices. So here L is three. So here one would need to just construct two three cross three matrices of this form. So if you know these initial U's, not initial, the time dependent U's, then you can fully determine these two matrices. And from these two matrices, you can construct the full density matrix, okay? And this is because these are integrable models. So from that, you can then obviously construct the entanglement entropy and all local correlation functions. So here you can see the entanglement entropy as a function of number of uh, drive cycles. So as you can clearly see when n is small, number of drive cycles is small, there's obviously an area law, right? So in one dimension, area law would just say that it's L to the zero, right? So you can see that as a function of subsystem size, this entanglement entropy saturates. So you drive it a bit more, it saturates a bit later. Drive it a bit more, it saturates a bit later and so on. This length scale actually then tends to infinity as you go to the n tending to infinity limit as you drive it many, many, many times. And in the steady state, you actually get genuine uh, non-area-like scaling, okay? So actually, it's even very interesting to see how this approach to the volume law happens. So there are some non-obvious things there, but maybe I won't discuss that today in view of time. So let me just uh, tell you very quickly how to understand uh, uh, this approach to the uh, steady state, okay? So to do that, uh, what we need to realize is that we are looking at periodically driven uh, systems. So when we want to think of the steady states there, we actually need to think, oh, sorry. We actually need to think uh, uh, of looking at operators stroboscopically. So what it means is you maybe look at them at zero, t, two t, and so on. So, okay, so as a function of the drive period. Uh, well, you can also look at it like, epsilon, epsilon plus t, epsilon plus 2t, and so on, where epsilon is some general number. And then you will see that these stroboscopic uh, quantities would actually then ultimately go to a steady state, okay? And there's actually some very nice work by my colleague Arnab Das in that area as well. Uh, I did not include the citation there, but okay, you can look it up. Uh, right. Now, when you do the stroboscopic measurement, uh, so for one drive cycle, you can r imagine that you can write the unitary matrix for that time evolution, for that drive cycle, right? Now this uh, unitary matrix can then, because this is a unitary matrix, can then always be written in this form, right? Okay. And this object is then not explicitly dependent on time, even though the full problem, you know, the coupling is dependent on time. And this object is called the fluke ham. Now, we'll see that the properties of this object dictates the relaxations uh, in these kinds of problems. So because of the integrable two cross two structure here in terms of the Jordan-Wigner fermions, uh, 
one can show that the uh, 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 fluke Hamiltonian can again be written simply in k space in the following manner, sigma dot epsilon. So at each k again, it's like a magnetic field, okay? And this sigma is just uh, the three Pauli matrices. And this epsilon k is like the magnitude of that magnetic field at some k. Then, uh, okay, you can, okay, then you just need to consider this object because I won't be able to derive these expressions right now. Uh, you can actually show that this object phi of k, which is just proportional to the modulus of this sigma of k, actually controls the relaxation. So, okay, these are some local correlation functions of the fermions. These are their infinite n values. So these are the steady state values and everything else would relax to zero if n is tended to, if n goes to infinity, okay? However, you can actually see that just from the structure of these integrals that basically what would control the late n behavior of this integral, the late time behavior of this integral is the functional properties of this phi of k. Okay, so basically the saddle points of this phi of, oh, of this phi of k uh, control the late time relaxations, okay? So uh, this is what uh, we can then analytically calculate and let me just flash this result, explain this and stop because I am running out of time. So, uh, so this is this uh, calculation. So I said I can calculate this modulus of phi of k analytically, right? Then one can even calculate the derivative of that analytically and let's say you do it for different frequencies for some kind of a driving protocol. Then at large omega, you can actually show just by looking at the Dyson series for this unitary matrix U that uh, this fluke Hamiltonian is just the average Hamiltonian during a single drive cycle, okay? And this quantity is very easy. You don't need to, you don't even need to do any dynamics to get that. And if you just take that and plot the derivative of this, you will see that there is a derivative only at this uh, Brillouin zone corner at pi. Now, if you actually go to lower frequencies, you will actually see that there are uh, non-trivial stationary points which are neither at zero nor at pi, okay? So, however, this cannot happen immediately because you see that the number of zeros uh, inside this zero pi open interval is an integer, so that cannot change continuously. So this, uh, 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 this, first point, omega critical is, has to be a finite number. The second thing is that when you go to small omega, you can also show that the number of saddle points inside is actually scaling as one by omega. And basically the key point is if there are saddle points which are inside this zone boundary, they have a qualitatively different behavior for relaxation than when there are things at zero and pi, okay? And so that gives you a completely qualitatively different uh, relaxational properties. And in 1D, you can also have uh, uh, re-entrant transitions and uh, uh, there are other interesting things which emerge in 2D, but uh, uh, I unfortunately don't have uh, time to discuss that. So uh, thank you very much. Yeah. of the entanglement so um, so the energy scale you, you mentioned that at very high energy scale it goes to the volume law actually not even high in any finite energy density state would typically show I see. Volume. that was the question i was asking that what is this energy scale actually so, so anything which is a finite energy density i would expect it to see and and in 1d yeah. i mean in some cases like if you have a, if you are close to a quantum critical point then you will have a log l behavior oh that's correct so yeah uh, that's correct but that's just a multiplicative correction which can be easily understood Whether you have uh, area law or volume, volume law, that's probably independent of integrability, right? Or that's exactly that's right. That's exactly right. It's just that for these kind of questions, integrable models, you can analytically show lots of things, whereas for non-integrable... expect them things to change uh, like qualitatively if it was non-integrable? And... Uh, well, uh, the area law, volume law statement won't change, but these uh, dynamical transitions may change. That I don't know. That's something which I'm exploring right now. 
what was asked. So uh, in a non, uh, non-integrable models, uh, typical, uh, typical entanglement, uh, especially in excited states, would be expected to be that of you know, random states. Yeah. So, uh, but uh, you say that even, even integrable models will have uh, volume law. That's right. But would it be anything like that of random states? Well, it'll be a bit different because, uh, uh, well, if you just look at the entanglement entropy and look at its scaling, that's again just a volume law. Yeah. But uh, if you look at the level of density matrices, there's a lot more structure there. Right. So for non-integrable models, the density matrix would be purely thermal, whereas for, so Gibbsian, e to the minus beta h, uh, if I think of models like this. Uh, but for integrable models, uh, Basically, there are many other conserved integrals of motion. So there'll be one, more, one Lagrange multiplier for each of these conserved uh, integrals of motion. But after that, it's basically the same story. Yeah. If you just make that addition. <laughs>